With modern aircraft, we possess the technology to fly safely and confidently in the sky. We have realized mankind's dream to fly like the birds with ease and control. Pilots see things like no one else. Our perspective changes when we learn to fly. Once we know how to control our aircraft, knowing whether to fly is an important safety concept every time we fly. Weather is part of everyone's life every day. It has a major impact on all plants and animals. Weather determines whether we thrive or perish. It can be gentle and soothing. It can be extreme and devastating. My name is Paul Hamilton. I'm going to show you the Weather to Fly system specifically designed for sport pilots. Learning Weather to Fly first allows you to determine whether it's safe to fly. Second, it allows you to fly with confidence because it will help you understand what the air will be like and why the air is doing what it's doing. We are going to cover the five steps of the Weather to Fly system. The first step is the information resources preparation. This is where you look at your available weather assets to determine the overall weather in your region along with local forecasts. We are going to cover how to get the best weather information fast and easy. The second step is to observe the weather conditions at your local site where you plan on flying. Here we will learn to observe winds, clouds, and terrain features. Once we assemble the weather information gathered, we must make the decision of whether to fly. Here we will take into consideration our state of mind, experience, plus our aircraft capabilities and limitations. If everything looks good, the fourth step is to fly and utilize the information gathered to make our flight safe and enjoyable. The fifth and final step is to compare our experiences from the flight with our predictions and the actual observed conditions while we flew. Was the air like we expected? Did anything happen that we did not understand? Would we fly in that type of air again? Did we feel comfortable flying in that type of air? What caused the type of air we flew in? Asking and evaluating these questions completes the final step in the Weather to Fly system. When learning weather, why the global view? First, it helps us understand how the weather starts and how it works. Second, it helps us predict better what the weather might do during our flight and flights in the coming days. We will look at the troposphere layer of the atmosphere. This is where the weather occurs. It's about 5 miles thick at the poles to 10 miles thick at the equator. The temperature drops 2 degrees Celsius for each 1,000 feet in altitude for the standard atmosphere. The essence of all weather starts with the energy from the sun. The sun is a hydrogen to helium nuclear reactor that beams intense radiation to our Earth continuously. The second source of weather energy is the Earth's incredible rotational momentum. The velocity at the poles is zero, but because of the Earth's rotation and diameter, the equator is traveling over a thousand miles per hour. This surface velocity, combined with large air masses, helps to create air momentum and winds. The sun's radiant energy is most intense directly under the sun in the equatorial region. This intense heating under the sun of the surrounding air causes it to expand and rise. Simply hot air rises. This hot and moist air mass is towering 
and full of energy. Meanwhile, the air at the poles is continually cooling, shrinking, spreading out, and creating a cold air mass that builds up as the air is continuously cooling. A situation is set up with a high point at the equator and a low point at the poles. The upper air from the equator flows downhill towards the poles and the air in the poles breaks loose and flows towards the equator. This simplified model is the starting point for global airflow. These constant temperature differences from the heated air at the equator and cooling air at the poles causes the continual mixing of hot and cold air which creates our weather. Another important factor that influences the overall wind is the Earth's rotation. At the poles, the Earth's surface speed is zero, but increases as you travel away from the poles. As the polar air starts heading towards the equator and the Earth's surface speed increases, the Earth starts to turn under the air. This causes an apparent turn to the right There are a number of ways to look at the regional weather, such as newspapers and TV. We will utilize the internet site weathertofly.com because it's laid out with the important sport pilot concepts in order. There we are. Now what we're going to do is come down to the fronts, pressure systems, surface analysis maps. What we see here front here, nice high pressure, and another disturbance right here, another uh, cold front. So this is generally all uh, cold air, a cold front that's come through, another cold front. What is a cold front? Let's start with a cold air mass that comes down from the poles as we saw with a global view of airflow. The cold air mass has relatively heavy dense air in comparison to the air in front of it. This cold air plows under the warmer air and thrusts this warm air up. This rising air in unsettled weather with rain, gusty winds, and challenging flying conditions. Cold fronts can cause moderate to severe weather situations for sport pilots and should generally be avoided. Now let's look at the specific local conditions caused by the regional weather and how to determine what the local air will be like where we specifically fly. This is where we'll find out if the air is appropriate for us to fly in and what the air will be like. Here we will look at the upper air and specific values for horizontal wind, stability with vertical air currents, moisture in the air, air pressure with the barometer, and the time of day. We will look at the upper air, which is considered to be about six miles straight up. This upper air directly affects the air we fly near the ground. It provides a forecasting tool as to what the air might do later in our flight and during landings. Different terrain features such as mountains, deserts, forests, plains, and oceans create unique local weather patterns. Here we will discuss these and what airflow characteristics are typical of different terrain features. If you ask the local pilots about the flying conditions at the site you plan on flying, you will learn through their stories. Techniques for observing the wind direction and speed while you're at your site can also be used while you're flying. We will use the term velocity here because it includes both speed and direction. Wind socks are a great indicator of wind velocity because most of them are calibrated for speed. A 25 mile per hour wind sock can go as low as 8 miles per hour and still provide good wind direction. Let's look at large scale and small scale mechanical turbulence in greater detail. As the wind increases, Air momentum creates rotors in back of any building, tree, or object. As the breeze increases, the rotors break off and drift downwind. 
water flowing into rocks demonstrates high wind turbulence as the smooth flow turns into turbulence or white water. This turbulence is typical for large mountains and small buildings. Air tends to flow smoothly over large mountains up to 10 miles an hour, becomes turbulent and challenging from 12 to 15 miles per hour, and hazardous about 18 miles per hour. Our research of step one provides regional information of fronts, pressure systems, and the jet stream. We can determine if there are any large-scale disturbances moving through. Our research of local conditions including upper air, stability, moisture, and barometer provides us a clear indication of what the weather people think is going to happen to the air for our flight. Our actual observations in step two tell us what the wind and sky are doing and what might happen as the day progresses. We now have enough information to compare the predicted and observed weather to our aircraft limitations and pilot capabilities. We simply look at the numbers and make sure we do not exceed limitations. If all looks good, we must do a final evaluation of our physical and emotional state. As commonly quoted by smart pilots, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. When the weather, your aircraft, and yourself are all looking good, it's time to fly. We use all our research and observations while flying, but first we use it for flight planning. If there is wind and you plan on flying an out and return, it is best to fly into the wind first so you have a tailwind on your return. Many times the wind will increase during your flight and you want to make sure that you'll have enough fuel to make it back to your destination with changing or increasing winds. Was the flight what you expected? If it was, you have a good understanding of the conditions you flew in and can confidently predict similar conditions in the future. If things happen that you did not expect or understand, you can go back and look at the actual conditions while you flew. Compare your predictions to actual conditions. Adjust your predictions in the future from what you learned. Try to notice trends and patterns for your climate zone and local area. Weather adds spice to our adventure in the sky. I hope you've enjoyed our look at Weather to Fly. We have looked at the global energy engine and how the weather starts. We have learned to find information resources for regional weather systems plus local conditions and upper air. We looked at observing the clouds, terrain, and wind at your local site, all to make the decision of whether to fly. We discussed how to utilize this information to make better decisions while flying. And finally, we compared our flight to our predictions to get smarter each time we fly. Practice these safety concepts and you will fly with confidence as you enter the sky for the adventure of a lifetime. This is Paul Hamilton, signing off for now and hoping to see you in good air.